the reading of the scripture. Today we are going to be um, hearing the word of God from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. And Paul uh, wrote in this letter through the uh, guidance of the Holy Spirit, and this is what these verses say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purposes of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Amen. You can be seated. Father, take this word and make it yours. Amen. So, uh, good morning. It's uh, snowy outside, so I'm, I'm glad to see you all, and I know that there will be uh, those that will be listening to this message uh, through the YouTube stream. So if that is you right now, please go, and before the, you listen to this message, find the song, Grace Alone, by The Modern Post, right? I think that's the name of the group. And listen to that song, and then listen to this, because it'll be good. All right, so now for everybody else. Um, Today we're going to be looking at a long set of scripture, verses 3 through 14. Is that me? Okay, we'll see if that makes it better. So we're going to be looking at 11 verses. And in the original Greek language, this was all one sentence. And uh, many uh, Greek scholars, there was a Greek scholar that said this uh, when he was discussing or talking about these verses. He called them the most monstrous sentence conglomeration that has ever been found in the Greek language. So that's what we're going to look at today, uh, this uh, 11 verses. And I'll share with you that as I was um, preparing for this uh, message, I was unsure as to how much of this text we were going to talk about today. Originally, I was going to do just the first part, and then I realized it was all one sentence, so I said, well, we need to do the whole thing all together. And then I realized if I do that, then we're going to miss a lot of stuff. So I talked with Pastor, and so we're going to be in this section of Scripture for a little while because we're going to talk about it as, as one long sentence today, and then we're going to look at the parts because just a heads up, there's a, the Trinity is in these 11 verses. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The, the song that we sang, uh, Grace Alone, the verses of that song go through those sections of these verses. So there's a lot to unpack here. And so we're going to take some time to make sure that we do that well. Um, so last week, uh, Pastor started us out on our journey through the book of Ephesians. And he gave us some guidance and, and, and prayed for us that as we go through this letter that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, that we would um, be different once we came out the other side. That we would be who we are, and then after we went through these verses, that, that we would be different. 
And obviously, in order for that to happen, something has to change. We've got to learn something. We need to be refined by the Word of God. And so that is my prayer also uh, as we go into this section. These are some of the most precious verses uh, that we can read out of the Bible. Um, uh, and I probably say it every time I, I get up to speak, but um, they are beautiful. So I pray that we will have this sermon today and then we'll learn about some more and that you'll be at home looking at these verses on your own as well. Because uh, there's a way, I was giving the analogy of uh, making maple syrup the other day. When the sap comes out of the tree, there's a lot of sap that comes out and they boil it down, they boil it down, they boil it down. And then they finally get the syrup and you put it on your pancakes and it's so sweet and it's so awesome. And that's what I'm going to try to pour out for you today. But there's a lot of stuff that got boiled off. Um, and so you, you should, you ought to go back and find the stuff that got boiled off, uh, as well. So as we look through this text, there are, um, some certain words in here that can cause, um, debate or can cause us to be uncomfortable. And those two words are the word chosen and predestined. So I just want to address that just quickly before we, we move on with the lesson, because there's this conflict that comes between what we would term as sovereign election and man's responsibility. And this can become a problem because us, as uh, human beings, we don't like things that don't reconcile. We like to say, well, this is like this, and this is like this, and it comes together, and see how great isn't that wonderful? Um, but guess what? We don't have the mind of God, so we can't reconcile everything in Scripture that has a difference. So we come to these two ideas and we say, well, either it has to be all God or not. And either it's our choice or he just does it. And Scripture tells us both things. There, We, we can see both things. So... Um, in my preparation for this message, I was studying out of a commentary by a pastor named uh, John MacArthur, and he addressed this um, struggle in his commentary. And I just wanted to share with you this quote, mostly because Chris is always sharing quotes from people, so I thought I should, I want to be cool too. So here is my, I'm just kidding. I think this will be helpful. So this is uh, what he said, and I, I think uh, this can be helpful for us as we go through and look at these verses. And so here's what he wrote. Although man's will is not free in the sense that many people suppose, he does have a will, a will that scripture clearly recognizes. Apart from God, man's will is captive to sin, but it, but he is nevertheless able to choose God because God has made the choice possible. Jesus said that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life, and that everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. The frequent commands of the unsaved to respond to the Lord clearly indicate the responsibility of man to exercise his own will. Yet, the Bible is just as clear that no person receives Jesus Christ as Savior who has not been chosen by God. Jesus gives both truths in one verse in the Gospel of John. All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. God's sovereign election and man's exercise of responsibility in choosing Jesus Christ seem opposite and irreconcilable truths. And from our limited human perspective, they are opposite and irreconcilable. That is why so many earnest, well-meaning Christians throughout the history of the church have floundered trying to reconcile them. Since the problem cannot be resolved by our finite minds, the result is always to compromise one truth in favor of the other or to weaken both by trying to take a position somewhere between them. We should let the autonomy remain believing both truths completely and leaving the harmonizing of them to God. So I found that to be very uh, helpful as I was reading through this text 
because we all maybe fall on one side or the other. We all may fall more to the God's sovereign election and or some to man's choice. And and this text or this point says, no, both are reality in Scripture. And we should stop trying to erase one to keep one or whatever. So I also uh, like to think of it this way. Um, we don't need to reconcile friends. So... Uh, scripture points both of them out. They're both in Scripture, so we don't need to reconcile them. Let God take care of that. We just praise him. And that's what's going on here in this, these verses. Uh, Paul is trying to remind the church in Ephesus of uh, that everything that he is going to discuss is to the praise of his glory. So all of the things that we have and and even our salvation is to the praise of the glory of God. And so Paul is going about trying to show that and magnify that for them. Typically, at this point, right after the introduction, Paul would have had a thanksgiving. He would have had a prayer of thanks for the church that he was writing to. Not in this letter. In this letter, he begins by thanking God for all that he has done and reminding them. I want to just give you one other thing, give you a little flashback before we get going on the actual, digging into the actual text. We flash back um, to a little bit ago, but after we did Micah, and then before we talked about discipleship, we went through the letters that Jesus wrote to the churches. And if you remember, the very first letter that we did was a letter to the church in Ephesus. Yes? Um, which is the church that we're, this letter here was written to, uh, the church. Uh, and here is one of the things that Jesus said to the church in Ephesus. Um, keep in mind the book of Revel, this letter from Jesus was written after the letter Paul wrote. So Paul wrote this letter. Later on, Jesus had this to say about the church in Ephesus, uh, from Revelation chapter two, verses four and five. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. So, as we go through this text, I want us to be thinking on how this text helps us to glory and to praise God for his glory and to return to our first love. Because we all, like the church in Ephesus, have a tendency to forget our first love. That would be the gospel, and we're going to talk about that. So as we go through this, those are the two focuses. Um, almost to make us think in our minds that when the church in Ephesus heard those words from Jesus, that they would have went back and looked at this letter from Paul and saw that first part of this, this, these verses and realized, oh yeah, that's why I love Jesus. So we're going to dig into it. How does this text show us why we should be praising his glory and returning to our first love? So we're going to have four points that we're going to hit uh, that, that should cause us to do that. Um, First one comes from verses 3 and 4, which read, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So the first... Uh, way that this text helps us to uh, praise God is it reminds us that the Father placed us in Christ, and through that, we receive every spiritual blessing, okay? Before the foundation of the world, God saw that we, as people, would fail to uphold his laws his um, commands to us that we would fail to put him above 
everything else. This would be called sin. He saw that, and rather than at that point just scrapping the whole thing and starting over, he made a way, right? He made a plan, him with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together, the Trinity, they create a plan for mankind to have a way to be reconciled and be holy and blameless before the Father. In doing that, in order for that to happen, he has, before the foundation of the world, taken and placed us in Christ. The text here that says, um, but I have, oh, sorry. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. So he has placed us in Christ. And through that, we receive every spiritual blessing. So that's the first thing. God the Father even though we had fallen short, and he knew this, he created a way, a path that we would go down in our lives to the Lord. He placed us there. So this causes us, this ought to cause us to praise the Lord. Second thing is from, let me get a drink. Second, it reminds us that he gave us a path to adoption through Jesus. And for that, we are going to look at verses 5 and 6 and 8 through 10 of Ephesians chapter 1. And the text says, In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, that's the first time we hear that phrase in the text, with which he has blessed us in the beloved, Jesus, in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So, as we look at this uh, concept of adoption, that's what we're looking at right here is the, this word adoption. We look at that, we already said that God had created a, a path, a way um, for salvation. And he has placed, in, um, placed us in Christ so that we could be holy and blameless, set apart and blameless in Christ. But at the point that he has done this, before the foundation of the world, obviously we come into the world, and we come into the world um, sinners, not knowing God, slaves to sin, and all of these things. <clears throat> and in order for us to see our position in Christ, we need to be adopted into his family. So we go through life, and, G and the Lord leads us down the path. He takes us, he guides us, and at some point along the line, we come to a realization. We are God the Father reveals Jesus to us, and at that moment, we can begin to talk about this idea of um, a choice. We have now seen the glory of the Lord has been revealed to us, and... At that point, we are revealed the beauty of the Lord, and we are remade. And we become aware of our position in Christ. Before we were not aware, and now we are. This is a, a sense of already and not yet. So God has placed us in Christ before the beginning of time, before the foundation of the earth, but we're not necessarily aware of our position in Christ. And when we are become aware and we are remade, then... We are aware of where we are, and we see the beauty of who Christ is and what he has done. And we are reborn and adopted into, uh, to be sons, just as Jesus Christ was. Then as we move on into the second section of the 
of these verses. The first section that we just talked about is dealing with the Father and in the past what God has already done. In the second section, we, we see the work of the Son. And it reminds us that he sent his Son to provide us with redemption and forgiveness for our sins through the riches of his grace, which he has lavished upon us. So in verses 7 and 8, Paul writes, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. So we've talked a lot about the path that the Lord has made for us to come to a realization of who Christ is. But we haven't talked about what Christ actually did. Because if we come to a place of knowing who God is, but there is not a redemptive act that, ha- that makes us, um, that, that saves us, that pays the price, that atones for our sin, then there is little. But part of that uh, work that the Lord did before the foundation of the earth was to make that plan to send his son to the earth to live the perfect life that we couldn't live, right? And that act that the the son did is what gives us redemption and forgiveness. And without faith in that promise and the fulfillment of it, we have no redemption or forgiveness because we have been placed in Christ, we take part in the spiritual blessing that he provided. His perfect life becomes ours. He washes us and makes us holy and blameless. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So without the work of the Lord, to live that life, we can't come to the Father. Without knowing him, without trusting in his, his uh, work for us, his death on the cross, his resurrection, without those things, we can't come to the Father. So we rejoice and we praise the Lord and we glorify him because he has sent his Son to do this work that renews us makes us new, and without it, we, we don't have a hope. And this kind of act by God would be something that maybe would warrant a little bit of glory and a little bit of praise if there was something in us that was worthy of that, redemp- of that work, that was worthy of him doing what he did. But without Christ, we, we are just those that walk and, and we, we deny him and we, we, we see value and worth in things other than him. So we didn't have something that made us worthy other than his love. Through his love, he made a way for that to happen because he has loved us. Then the fourth reason why this text shows us that we should praise God is out of verses 11, 13, and 14. And this is at the bottom part of these verses, and this is a section that we would say has to do with the Holy Spirit and his work, and has to do with um, the future, now and the future. It reminds us, It reminds us that by the Holy Spirit, we have an inheritance that is sealed and guaranteed. So those verses say, In him we have obtained an inheritance. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. 
So in these verses, Scripture is clear that we come to a knowledge of Jesus through the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation. Scripture reveals to us what, who Jesus is, what he has done, and obviously, the Holy Spirit is tied directly to the Scripture in the fact that he um, inspired the Scripture. And as we come to the Lord, he works in our spirit to reveal the Scripture. So not only has he written it, he's also becomes the pathfinder for us. So God has made a way for us to get to the Lord, the Holy Spirit reveals Scripture, speaks with our spirit, and uh, guides us down the path to know who he is. He reveals the word to us. This is why before we we, uh, study uh, Scripture, before we read Scripture, we ought to pray. We ask the Holy Spirit to come and and be with us uh, and guide us and protect us as we go through the word so that what we see is what he intended for us to see. The Holy Spirit is the one who is the uh, guide, the path uh, finder, the path. He's, uh, if you will, as you're uh, going on a, I don't know, I never did this, but I know like if you go through like the Grand Canyon, you may go with somebody that leads you through the Grand Canyon to show you the path so you don't get lost. The Holy Spirit leads us uh, down the path that leads us to the Lord. Not only that, though, he leads us to the Lord and to a realization of our place in Christ. But it's not as if he leaves us then once we're there. And this is where we have the understanding that the Holy Spirit is the one that has sealed and guaranteed our inheritance. As we are in Christ, we have an inheritance, which is the blessings of all the blessings of the, the, the spiritual blessings that come as we're in Christ. We have an inheritance that after we die, we uh, reside with the Lord in heaven. And the Holy Spirit not only leads us there, but he holds us there. He is the seal. We are sealed so that we will never go away from him. The We we look at Luke 15, and we see the parables of the lost coin, the sheep, the prodigal son. We see two things going on there. We see the Lord's heart for the lost to go and find them and bring and and search for the coin because it has great worth. Um, to go and get the one sheep that has wandered away, and the the celebration that happens when the the prodigal son comes back. So we see there that the Lord is seeking after those that are lost, but we also see there that He goes and seeks us when we wander off. He is the good shepherd. There's many shepherds. You go into the wrong, uh, the, the sheep knows their shepherd, the sound of their voice. If a shepherd tries to lead the sheep away, then the sheep is weary because they know the sound of their shepherd. Our shepherd, the good shepherd, never loses one of his sheep. We may wander and, and get off track, but he brings us back. So where, where can we see that other than here? The, this scripture clearly says that the Holy Spirit is the seal, the guarantee of our inheritance, right? So it's not up to me. It's not in my, my power or my strength or my wisdom to, to, to get and actually receive this inheritance one day. Because if it was... We probably shouldn't gather because it's really no hope for any of us, I don't think. We're not the ones that have to do this thing. But if we read, for for some of you, you know that I have uh, spent the last, I don't know, how many months do you think, going uh, studying through the book of 1 Corinthians 
And I, we, we're going through it in the youth group, we're going through it in the men's group. So when you go through text this much, it, everything comes out of that text. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, there is this text that you've probably heard. And it says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will provide the way of escape that you will be able to endure. Okay? So this is another text that we can look at and see that not only does the Holy Spirit lead us to a knowledge of Christ and reveal him to us, he also provides a way that as we go through life, after that point, he will provide a way to hold us for that inheritance. We also have the amazing realization that in the high priestly prayer in the book of John, Jesus says, he tells us that he is in heaven interceding for us, praying for his children. I love to pray to God. I love to ask him for strength to get me through the troubles of life. Because there are a few. But the thing that comforts me way more than the, even more than the fact that the Lord asked me to come and ask him for help and to, and to ask us, ask him for strength in trouble is the realization that Jesus is interceding for me in that moment. That that fills me with a strong desire to want to praise the Lord. Strong desire. As sinful people, as people on this earth, as human beings, we tend to want to focus on ourselves. Anybody? I do it once in a while. I'll, a lot of times in the morning, I might give you a list of the, the problems I have. But because of that need to focus on ourselves, we ask ourselves these questions. These are just four that I wrote down that we tend to ask ourselves that get us off track from praising God. What do I need to do to be saved? What have I done that makes me saved? What have I done that makes me so, uh, or on the other side, so that's like me pumping myself up. What have I done? Look at what I've done. But the other side is, what have I done that makes me so terrible that I can't be saved? Some people look at themselves and they see, there's no hope for me. Look at me. Nothing could save me. And then we ask ourselves, what do I need to do to hold on to my salvation? So we ask ourselves those questions, right? Here's the, the issue with those questions. Those questions focus on who? Me. Okay. Well, there are things that we need to do. We need to, to pray to God. We need to uh, read the scripture. We need to sing hymns of praise. We need to have fellowship. We need to do those things. But... Here's the thing, as soon as our focus goes on what I have done and what I need to do, where does the glory go? As soon as we start to give ourselves and and check off a list, I did that, I did that, I did that, I'm good. You know what I did? I had this terrible thought. I took that thing from that person. I was rude to that guy. That's what I did. What did God do? God washed away and made a way for me. So we need to stop. This text is trying to remind us that what we need to look at is not me. It's not ourselves. We need to look at God. And when we do that and we give over to him the credit 
for all, for our salvation, for our destination, then we stop looking at what I've done wrong or how I can't receive this or I am, I'm actually pretty good. I know some other people and they're kind of shady, but I kind of tend to fall more to that side of like, I'm, I'm not that bad. I clean up pretty good, brush the hair. It's all, I'm looking pretty good. But as soon as we start doing that stuff, we take away from his glory. Either we think we did some of it or I'm too bad for, for him to do anything. But if we rightly see ourselves as beyond self-salvation, the truth of what God has done for us uh, is placed in Christ and ought to cause us to praise him. If we rightly realize that God has provided the only way to redemption and forgiveness through Christ, we ought to praise him. If we rightly realize that God has sealed our inheritance and will keep us in Christ until the end, we ought to praise him. So, my prayer for you is as you look at this text and as we go through this text in the next few weeks, that you will be continuously reminded and drawn to, want to, praise him and see him and not see yourself. Okay? We ought to praise him. Even in the midst of our own struggle to do what he asks us to do and we see ourselves failing and we turn to him and we, we see him working in our hearts. We ought to praise him because he has made a way. He has made a path and he keeps us there. My prayer was going to be the song that Mindy, Mindy, uh, did before, but with, with everything here, I'm just going to give a prayer and then, and we can all, uh, be released to go, uh, on our journeys home or to fellowship or, whatever you'd like to do. Um, Lord, um, I pray to you, Lord, that you would take this word, these verses, and you would open them to us uh, over the weeks to come and even today as we're on our way home to be again reminded and to cause ourselves to return to our first love. That as we go uh, through life, and through this week, even, and trouble arises, or, or we become to have a, a self-deprecating opinion of ourselves that we would be reminded of the fact that the Lord has, has, uh, made us new. And that if we become too self, uh, engrandized, that you would remind us that without you, we would have nothing. Show us your grace and show us your glory, for without it we are little. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.